Welcome back to Talking Europe. Well, located on the edge of the EU, Ireland is nonetheless regularly at the heart of European debates. Today, as the only country that shares a physical border with the United Kingdom, many eyes are looking at how the island will position itself in a post-UK EU. Irish taxpayers had to dig deep and accept harsh austerity measures in order to enable the country to exit its Eurozone bailout back in 2013. But with its largest trading partner now opting out of the bloc, where does that leave Ireland? Well, our guest of the week is Ireland's Minister for Foreign Affairs and for Trade, Mr. Charles Flanagan. A very warm welcome to the show. Mr. Flanagan, now you're visiting here in France to talk about business opportunities and indeed the question of Brexit with your French counterpart. Uh, Ireland already maybe looking to solidify or grow their relations with other EU countries before this Brexit happens? I always love coming to Paris in France. I think it's particularly beautiful this week in the winter sun. Uh, but yes, I come here uh, with a very important challenge to the fore in my mind. Uh, very pleased to have a meeting with Foreign Minister, my friend Jean-Marc Ayrault, uh, where we discussed a host and range of international issues in the European Union and beyond, uh, but primarily, I think, the matter of Brexit. I've been busily um, engaged in talking to my EU colleagues over the past number of months. I've had the opportunity of speaking to each and every one of them individually uh, on the Irish concerns that you mentioned. Uh, and yes, we do have unique concerns uh, sharing, as we do, uh, land border with the UK, uh, the common travel arrangements that we've had with the United Kingdom um, since our independence in 1922. Uh, and that has had the effect of ensuring that hundreds of thousands of people have left Ireland to live and work and prosper in Britain. They qualify for pensions. Uh, they come and go freely. Uh, and it's really important that that be fully recognised in the context of the negotiated... Give me an idea of, of how, what Ireland is thinking now. Because, you know, uh, France, for example, it's its fourth largest mm. trading partner, I believe. Is that a market that Ireland needs to see grow uh, in order to survive in a, in a post-UK EU? Well, very much so. Um, Ireland is a small, open economy. We are firmly in favour of open markets and free trade. We prosper. Under these circumstances, we like these challenges. Irish people respond very well to international engagement. Uh, and yes, in the context of, uh, of the withdrawal of the UK, um, we need to acknowledge the fact that being uh, our closest trading partner, uh, trade between Ireland and the UK is uh, in excess of 1.2 billion euro every week. Uh, and uh, it's important that uh, we maintain and protect that very positive relationship, uh, but also we're forging new markets in France. Because you, you mentioned <clears throat> there 1.2 billion a week in Irish-British trade. I believe the figure is 1.4 billion a month for, for Franco-Irish trade. Between Ireland and France, so and that's when, constantly improving. When you look at it, though, today, <clears throat> um, you know, the UK is Ireland's biggest market. The US is Ireland's second biggest market. Financially, should Ireland not start questioning its membership of the EU? Absolutely not. Uh, Ireland uh, has enjoyed... Um, our membership of the European Union since 1973, when we joined along with Denmark and the UK. Uh, Irish people are firmly engaged um, in Europe. Um, I'm struck in my capacity as, a, as a, an elected member of Parliament when I go to schools. I see the EU flag. I see young Irish people embracing the European project. I see many uh, tens of thousands of uh, Irish people living and working, uh, enjoying the relationship at the heart of Europe. So Ireland is firmly committed to Europe. Still, because I, I remember back to the Lisbon Treaty in 2008, the Irish people rejected it firstly, I mean, before <coughs> they passed it again in October 2009. Um, but half the UK against it today. Do you think the Irish people really would, would revalidate their membership of the EU? I mean, a lot of it came down, I think, to the, the question of neutrality. And since the Brexit, we're increasingly hearing from the EU that we need an EU army. Well, referendums are, are, are always difficult challenges uh, and there are uh, a range of issues across the European project with which Ireland is fully engaged. Um, uh, perhaps the most important being in terms of our, our trading, uh, the freedom of movement uh, of our people. And Ireland fully subscribes to the, uh, the fundamental freedoms um, of Europe. And I think it's important uh, in the context of this ongoing debate about Europe uh, that we as political leaders, 
perhaps revert to first principles, the importance of the European project in terms of peace and stability, uh, the fact that Europe and the coming together um, of European states uh, was as a result of two vicious and horrific um, world wars in the, uh, in the 20th century mm. uh, that cost millions of lives throughout Europe and beyond. And we want to ensure, and the founding fathers of Europe um, in the mid-1950s wanted to ensure uh, that there would never be a repeat of the horrors. When you mentioned peace there, I immediately think of uh, the issue of Northern Ireland. You know, a large part of, of the peace process was <coughs> the fact that it was all part of a, a European Union. Um, now, if we have a Northern Ireland that leaves uh, the EU, you know, people are, are wondering how stable is that peace process? Well, there are six million people on the island of Ireland, four and a half in the, in the south, in the Republic in Ireland, one and a half in the north. Uh, we are now faced with a situation having regard to the fact that the people of Northern Ireland who voted, a majority of those voted in favour of remaining mm. in the European Union. Uh, but <clears throat> it's important, therefore, uh, that we acknowledge the important role that Europe has played uh, in Irish matters over a long Is number it in of jeopardy, years. Though? Uh, and not only um, in terms of assisting economic regeneration, North and South, but also a, a very positive role that the European Union played in our peace process. It's important that we recognise uh, how the peace process evolved. And I look to figures like John Hume, who as a member of the European Parliament, actually brought Northern Ireland and our peace process firmly to Europe. And there were times and when there were times when political discourse wasn't possible on the island of Ireland between Belfast and Dublin or between or, or between London and Dublin. European figures like John Hume. Uh, was able to provide an umbrella uh, of Europe to bring people together, ultimately resulting in the historic Good Friday Agreement, but a, um, a, um, an internationally recognised legal document, which in the context of Brexit uh, is going to have to be fully considered. And indeed, when you look <clears> at Deputy First Minister for Northern Ireland, Martin McGuinness of the Sinn Féin Party, he says that this Good Friday Agreement isn't exactly being respected <clears> because in that agreement it says that there can't be constitutional change without the will of the majority of the people. And as you say, there are 56% voted remain. Well, what we have to do now um, it, in this pre-negotiated process uh, is to ensure uh, that the unique circumstances on the island of Ireland are fully recognised um, uh, in the UK, obviously, uh, but even more particularly across Europe. And in the context of, of my discussions with all of my EU colleagues, uh, I've been at pains to point out uh, the unique circumstance. For example, uh, the fact that since 1998, uh, the borders have been removed. Mm. In fact, the only visible sign of a border now between north and south is that you change from miles to kilometres as you come from north to south. But in terms of people-to-people -people contact, uh, we've got to acknowledge that in excess of 30,000 people every single day cross that border for school or college, or to work, for hospital treatment, uh, for all sorts of business. I look at, for we example, really agricultural again. communities north and south. The fact that 50,000 cattle per year cross that border. The fact that, for example, cows are milked um, in Ireland and that milk is processed in Northern Ireland, it's marketed and sold as Irish milk. So these are the type of challenges uh, mm -hmm. that are really going Big to challenge. engage the people directly involved in the negotiations. And it's absolutely essential uh, that the, the, the invisible nature of that border is fully respected and fully maintained. Anything it, else it, is going to give rise to adverse consequences of a very serious nature. Because it, it will be the external border of the EU, <clears> and you know the EU increasingly is becoming very concerned about its external borders. So do you think in Brussels, or the other 26 at the time, it will be 26 other member states with Ireland, that they won't demand something solid, something, you know, how will that border be controlled? I'm encouraged by the response that I've had from my EU colleagues, whether it's uh, in the UK, and I wish to acknowledge what Theresa May, what James Brokenshire, the new Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, indeed what Boris Johnson and David Davies have all said, and that is in relation to the border between North of Ireland and, and Ireland, uh, that they don't want to see uh, a return to the heavily fortified borders of the past. And neither do I. Uh, in fact, it's, it's inoperable or inconceivable uh, that such an arrangement could be considered. Uh, so we need to work through that. And uh, I'm satisfied that there is an understanding uh, among my EU colleagues of the, of the unique circumstance that pertains on the island of Ireland and the need to ensure uh, that we continue to build on 
our peace process and acknowledging as we do that the, that the political structures um, in Northern Ireland are quite fragile. Indeed, of course, it's only one of the regions <coughs> of the UK under question. Uh, we also have Scotland, Wales. Looking at what this post-Brexit <coughs> world might be, I believe uh, the idea of a Celtic corridor has been suggested by Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. She, she's hoping that even once the UK leaves, that they'll be able to maintain notably trade tiles, Edinburgh, Belfast and Dublin. What kind of form would that take? <coughs> Would that be if Britain stays in a single? Well, undoubtedly, uh, it's, a, it's a reality uh, of British politics uh, that the legacy uh, of David Cameron uh, will be uh, a weakened United Kingdom. Uh, obviously, that constitutional framework uh, is, to my mind, going to engage British politicians at the highest level for the next decade. Uh, the framework, for example, between England and Scotland, the relationship between England and Northern Ireland, the constituent uh, assemblies. But my primary focus, indeed my, my only focus, uh, is on the matter of Northern Ireland because that's where I have a legal standing in the context of the Good Friday Agreement where I and my government colleagues, Enda Kenny, we are actually co-guarantors uh, of that agreement. Uh, I look, for example, uh, at the one and a half million people in Northern Ireland, each and every one of those, should they wish, is legally entitled to Irish citizenship, an Irish passport. So you could conceivably have a situation where, where Northern Ireland, outside of the European Union, is populated by people, each and every one of whom is entitled to European citizenship. Uh, and, and, and I believe, you know, this is just one example of the major challenge that lies ahead in the negotiations. It's complex, it's difficult, uh, there are legal issues to be considered, and that's why now, you know, some five months after the result of the referendum, some five months after, after the British people have spoken, that it's important that we see now what the British ask is. We want uh, a UK that has as close as possible a relationship with the European Union while being outside of that union of 28. And of course, it will all remain to play exactly how that Brexit may may occur and what conditions. Um, one thing, though, already we're seeing a lot of other European countries uh, vying for is the business uh, that might leave London. Well, Ireland's very much open for business. Uh, we, we, we have come through uh, an acute and sharp and very, very challenging economic period from the international financial crash of 07, 08. Um, Ireland, being a small, open economy, suffered perhaps more than most. Um, and over the last four <coughs> years, uh, we, we have been actively engaged in ensuring our economic recovery. And indeed, we're very proud of what we've done. Uh, in 2012, for example, our unemployment rates were 15.2%. We have succeeded over a four-year period in actually having that uh, because Ireland is very much open for business. And yes, there will be uh, opportunities uh, should, should Britain uh, leave the EU in what they would describe as a hard Brexit by pulling down the shutters. I acknowledge the fact that there are